Well, if you would begin by turning to 2 Peter chapter 1. And then there will be two other passages that we'll be primarily looking at this morning. So we find ourselves at the seventh and final word, ingredient, element, virtue in this list in 2 Peter 1 that had carried us through verses 5 through 7. And just to remind you that this list of virtues is given by Peter as a reminder of something of a framework that if they are to practice these, if the people that live there in Turkey, or what we would consider to be modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, if they are to practice these things on a regular basis, then they will find that there will be some measure of, when I say success, simply that they will find joy in the midst of great difficulty. They will find that there will be endurance and hope for their future in Christ and even joy in their fellowship together. But up against that, there is, as First Peter dealt with, external persecution that could come from family, it could come from the workplace, it certainly can come from culture. They were living under the reign of Nero at the time. But also it can come from internal persecution like it was in Second Peter, which would be more in the realm of false teachers creeping in, a combination of just enough Christianese, Christian language coupled with their modern day philosophies like what we believe, or at least what I believe is Epicureanism, which is this philosophy from Epicurus that really life is the pursuit of a measure of pleasure, certainly the avoidance of pain. So then again, you can understand in light of 1 Peter, external persecution, if something is going badly for you, then you must not be doing right by your God. Of course, among the Greeks, that would be God's. Um, So basically, if you're hurting, if you're suffering, if things are going badly, then you must be doing something wrong. And honestly, there's something in us that still kind of clicks at this. There's a reason that false teachings align with people. It's because there's something innate in humanity that that lines up with this. It's, It's why every false teaching has with it some sense of inherent goodness. It's also because that's our nature. We think there's something inherently good in us just by being born and not being as bad as somebody else. And we also think, though, that there's something that we can do to get us out of our own mess. And that's just inherent in us. And so every false teaching, to some degree, has those kind of elements in it. Now, for those that are actually the teachers of these things, usually there's also an extra element of something related to personal gain. They're getting something out of it. Usually it's a buck or something, but usually it's, it's the dime. They're getting their bankroll... And um, so pleasure, money, everything else can be related to these things. And it certainly lines up with what's going on with the false teachers, as we will see when we get to chapter 2, because as Peter begins to line that out, he's very explicit in the kinds of things that these false teachers are promoting and practicing. So what I love then, again, though, about how Peter approaches these things is he doesn't begin by focusing on, here's how to identify all the false teachers. He reasserts, here is the gospel. Here's what we must understand about the nature of who Christ is, what he has done, his nature, who you are, who you've been made to be in light of who he is, and how that affects you and the church. And then in light of that, you can sniff out what is false and deal with it accordingly. But at the same time, it's interesting because Peter doesn't say run away. He doesn't say batten down the hatches. He doesn't say go and recluse, go and build a monastery, go and try to just run away and build a compound and hole up there. That's not what he says. They are in the midst of great difficulty and they are to continue to live faithfully in such a situation. Now, In light of that, he's made really clear in the first four verses of the nature of the gospel at work in the lives of these people. He starts out by saying that they are on equal ground as the apostles, that they have just as much good standing with God as the apostles do. That's crazy thought in their minds. There's not some hierarchy with God. And there's not because the only reason any of us would be good with God is because of Christ. He's the only one that satisfies God's requirement for for perfection and also God's requirement for sin, which is death. Now, we could satisfy that, but we could not satisfy the other end of that, which would be the resurrection part and actually then have eternal life. 
That's where God's love comes through and shines through. And that's part of what we're going to talk about today. So as he lays out this beautiful and glorious, gracious, sovereign gospel, he then says, now in light of that, make every effort to live this way. So it's definitely a grace-infused, grace-enabled effort. It's not, hey, just go do better. I mean, that's already built into us. We just, if we don't do well, do better. Find a different program, something. Coming up on New Year's resolutions, last year's didn't work. You know, good and well this year's isn't going to work, but you're going to do it anyway, and you're going to try to find a new workout system, a new exercise, whatever, and you just know the short-term stuff doesn't work, and you just need to change a little bit of your lifestyle, okay? You're welcome. But the idea there is simply that, I don't mean to be so discouraging, but the fact is, is that we, we have it built into us to just try to change, do our best, pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, and that's not how it works in the gospel. In fact, the gospel, Christianity, true Christianity, ours is the only religion that says it is done. What is required of you is actually already done for you. Not, here's what you have to do, and if you do it, maybe. It's done. If you believe that it's been done, and by whom it's been done, and believe that he is still alive, it's yours. Now, there's evidence of whether or not it's yours. And we'll also talk about that today. Which is interesting because Peter actually talks about that as well. In fact, much of First Peter, Second Peter chapter 1, culminates with this idea of, therefore, you'll see it down around verse 10 and 11, make every effort to work out your salvation. Make sure that you are basically in the fold. Make sure that you're a Christian. And a lot of all that he's talked about. It's interesting. In fact, that's going to help us in our view today, because when you're tackling a word like love, as we've come to today, I mean, how do you do that? How do you tackle such a simple word that is so big, so overused, so misapplied, especially in culture? It is used and abused and misused over and over and over again. The objects of love are spoken of so carelessly that essentially the word itself has just lost so much gravitas. There's just almost nothing that really bears that much weight. Now, if you're new to life or new to dating or new to engagement, it still carries quite a bit of weight and we're really happy for you. And if you are married, it should still carry some great weight in the covenant of your marriage. But just out in pop culture, it really carries very little. So you wonder, where do you start? I mean, do we start with some Beatles lyrics? I mean, we're also, I mean, we're close to Jersey, so we probably ought to start with some Bon Jovi lyrics, but that's, I mean, that's not going to help us either. I mean, we could head over to New York and get some there as well. But again, these lyrics are just representative of what's gone on with pop culture and what the thoughts are when it comes to love, which is really just boiled down to felt experiences and little when it comes to true sacrifice for the glory of God and the good of others, which is the biblical understanding. So last week when we talked about love and we talked, so if you go back three words to godliness, we talked about essentially that's kind of a gateway to the loves. And that idea of godliness was it's this circumspect understanding that the gospel is going to apply to all of who you are, every part of who you are, how you feel, what you see, how you see other people, how you see work, how you see marriage. It literally is going to bring an eternality to everything that you do and all that you are. It's going to bring a devotion to Christ at practical levels to the workplace, to just how you deal with people. And it really is a gateway to the loves in the sense that it's got to find an outworking. Because if there is a godliness, a devotion to Christ, it's got to work itself out. And the first thing he says is brotherly kindness, which that word is phileo. That is brotherly love. That is this familial affection. And essentially, that's the love for the church. That's the love for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's what we talked about last week. But then he culminates the whole list with agape or agapeo. He culminates it with this word of complete, sacrificial, God-like love. The only descriptor that is associated with God himself. 
as far as his love. When it's descriptive like this, when it's descriptive like this, when you say that God is love, or when you talk about God's exercising of his nature or of his work as being loving, it's always associated with this word. Why? Well, because the nature of the word is that it is a giving without any expectation in return, but that's not just because of pure selflessness. It's because of there absolutely is no need that possibly could be fulfilled in the act of love. Hang on to that, because what that means is basically a lot of times when we give, brotherly love is really a give and take. It doesn't mean that you're being duplicitous or sneaky. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to be nice to them so that maybe they're nice to me. It's really just the transaction of just being family, and you know that you both need to give love, and you also are going to need it. You just have needs. And that doesn't mean you're needy. It doesn't mean that you are, again, being sneaky or underhanded. It just simply means that you're acknowledging humbly so that you are not enough on your own. You're dependent. God, however, is independent. The Trinity is infinitely happy within itself. When he loves and gives of himself and gives everything necessary in the love of other people, it's not just because he's uber nice, it's because he literally needs nothing. It's an extension and an overflow of his glory and his grace, his very person being poured out on sinful men. And so then when it's turned then on us and we are to then be that expression, that means exclusively there is no way for anyone but a blood-bought, redeemed, truly born-again Christian to love this way. There is no way for anyone but a Christian to love like this. A person without Christ cannot love like God loves. You cannot. This is why it is so imperative for us as the church to love sacrificially in such a way because it is so distinctive of God. It cannot be mimicked. It cannot be duplicated. This is why it is such a travesty for the church to try to duplicate fellowship in political spheres. Or try to duplicate the kind of love and fellowship that you can find or the kind of benevolence that you can express just through government organizations. There is a uniqueness because we have the words of life. There should be something in us like when Peter says to Jesus, where will we go? You have the words of life. Was it Peter that said this, Tim? Tell me right now. That said, where will we go, Lord? You have the words of life. I don't think it was. I'm thinking it was maybe Stephen. I don't remember. All of you take a break from all of your eldership and everything until you get this. I'm just, you're supposed to help me with this stuff. Anyway, I admit I can't remember. But it is so important for us to have this desire to say, but there is something about us that is unique, not elevated, not arrogant, but distinct. This is part of holiness as well. Love is has been so cheapened as a word, as an identifier for the church, that I fear that we have substituted it. I I won't go that far with an analogy as I wanted to go just then, but we have substituted it as some would substitute the intimacy in a marriage for one night stand with someone who's not their spouse. I'll just, that's the really, really cleaned up version. But I think that disparity is representative and actually it's biblical because it's used often in the Old Testament of the exchange that we make of the love of God for cheap substitutes. So if we're going to talk about biblical love, then really what helps me instead of just really going all over the place is to look back at Peter and what he did with this. And I think that he really gives a bit of a book-ended look at what love really is 
And whether he meant to do this or not, we know the Spirit of God as is governing the writing of Scripture, breathing out of Scripture, certainly does. And the first place I would say is when you look at the very beginning of Second Peter 1, and he says, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, so if that would be, in a sense, a, a bookend of of love, the expression of God's love through the righteousness of Christ. And I'll show you this in just a minute. But then he also down in verse 10, when he says, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. And this is just post, um, you know, verse 7 and a couple of practical verses in 8 and 9 that we'll talk about uh, probably the beginning of the next year. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm. So you have basically salvation and you have the assurance of salvation. In chapter 1, in verse 1, you have, here's salvation, it's the righteousness of Christ. In verse 10, you have, here's the assurance of salvation. Make sure you're saved. Confirm. And the best way to be confirmed and, and sure that you're saved is, if you believe rightly and believe on Christ and live like a Christian, then verse 10, it'll be a lot easier to confirm that you really are. A lot of people that doubt whether or not they're Christians look for silver bullet verses to assuage all their doubts of sinful living. And that's really hard. There are people who are genuinely born again who have, they, they just stumble and trip over similar sins on a fairly regular basis, but it's not mine to say, oh, you're a Christian, you're just really struggling. Or on the other hand, to be able to really know their heart enough to go, brother, that is a, such a besetting sin. It doesn't look like to me you've ever repented. I think you're lost. I mean, I've just, it, it's just really hard to get to that place to make such a declarative statement either way. So all you're left with is saying, if you're a believer, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. And there should be something inside of you that begins to stir when you hear warnings of, the Scripture says you need to hold fast to your confession. The Scripture says you need to cease from sin. So a Christian, I think, begins to respond to warnings, appropriately so, and Again, not tries to keep themselves saved, but wants to live it out. And then they start to realize that assurance is really a blessing. It's not an inalienable right. I've done a lot of funerals for people who really did not have the blessing of assurance at the end. And yet there is still a testimony of grace that can be had for those that are living. But it's not my job to put a stamp of assurance on the dead. Sometimes you actually have to bear witness that those who died in a very questionable lifestyle at the end, all you can say is they left us with questions. Brothers and sisters, you don't have to leave that for those behind. That's why, that's why Solomon says there's more wisdom going to a funeral than there is going to a wedding. So guys, when we think about God's love, there's really just, I think, two clear places to go if we're going to look at Peter's view of Here's salvation, and here's the assurance of salvation. And I think that's in Romans 5, 6 through 11. I'm not going to do big, long, unpacked views of this. It's really just observations. If you go to Romans 5 first, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, to see how God's love is an expression. It's God's love displayed is salvation, the salvation of men. And you probably know these passages. If you don't, they'll be familiar when I start to read them. Verse 6. Romans chapter 5. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Okay? So keep that in mind. The person is seen as a good person. And even then, it's, it, the number is few, those who would die for a good person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, so while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is his love on display. It says it right there. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Okay, and that wrath is not speaking of tribulation or anything less than the wrath of God when it comes to the judgment of sin with eternal death. The wrath that Jesus bore on the cross. So when Jesus bore on the cross death, he bore your sin and the penalty, but he also bore God's wrath poured out on sinful men. There's a sense that Jesus bore suffering from both ends 
of the eternal spectrum. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So there's so much there, and the, the theology student in me wants to, you know, almost just didn't even want to read it because of the danger of what happens when you read a passage like this. But when it comes to this being a display of God's love, I think it's actually pretty beautiful, and I think it gives us an idea of what Peter was talking about, considering that he began his letter with, to those who have equal standing with ours by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God's love on display was Jesus Christ dying to justify those who were sinners at the time of his death, who were sinners at the time of their justification, that basically there was nothing lovable for those for whom he died. Okay, so this gives you an idea of anything that we see of God's love displayed, we're going to have to realize that what Peter's actually talking about is us displaying that kind of love. So keep that in mind, because anything that we've experienced in God's love is what we're to put on in loving others. So if we go, yes, I'm so glad that God did, you know, looked past, in a sense, all my sin, but he didn't. He packed it all in and bore all of the weight and bore all of the wrath associated and died in your place. Okay, you were radically unlovable. But that means if we're going to love other people the way that God loved us is that we don't get to put them on a scale of whether or not just how lovable or what level of unlovability we're willing to go to to actually love them. There doesn't get to be a particular lifestyle or a particular sin that you're just not going to, or a particular political party you're just not going to reach out and actually love people for. I mean, When you put that in perspective of what God has done in light of dying for you, think about what that is saying in response to God's dying for you and your unlovability and what conditions you're putting on whether or not you're going to love other people. And I'm speaking to Christians only because, again, only a Christian can love like God has loved you. So we bring nothing lovable to God. Christ becomes everything to the Christian. He says this. He makes his, I mean, we've been justified. He uses huge words, justified. We've been reconciled. He died. Having made us reconciled, already we are now brought into, through his life, a position of rejoicing now in Christ, ongoing, active. He's done so much stuff in the past that has totally made us right with him that in the present and in the active, we are in a position of being able to be in his presence. Instead of being dead, we now can be those who are okay with being in his presence, which means we have been made perfect and we are those who are rejoicing in his presence. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has made us able to stand in the presence of God and not be struck down dead. Why? Because he has satisfied everything that God would ever pour out on sin in his own body. And yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is God's love on display. You were unlovable. You were completely, utterly sinful. He died in your place. He made you justifiable and okay before God so that you would then culminate with rejoicing and exaltation of him. To speak of the goodness of Christ to the world. He is the only reason that any of us are okay with himself. And the result of all this atoning work is the glory of God and his goodness then on display, which again, more than that, verse 11. I mean, it just, it just, that phrase just keeps resonating more than that, more than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This gives us an idea of love. So love that we've experienced from God while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, reconciled us, made us right with him, that produces something in us. To then love like he does 
means that we want to rejoice in him. We want to see the goodness of that reconciliation put on display for others to also experience. The totality of our being redeemed, reconciled, made into new life and new creation should produce in us a rejoicing. If it does not, then invariably I think what it means is we have lost the sense of awe and wonder of what it means to be saved. Isn't that what Peter talks about whenever we don't increase in any one of these things in verses 5 through 7? Flip back to 2 Peter 1. Go back to verse 8. He says, if you do these things, you're going to do well. You're going to be productive. But verse 9, remember verse 9 is our what we call a recovery point. He says, however, or but, if you don't practice these things, or if you fail at any one of these things, whatever your translation may say, it's because of one thing. You are so blind that you're blind, is kind of what the wordplay is there. That you have forgotten what it means to be forgiven of former sins. And that includes love. So if you're not increasing in your love for a lost world, if you're not increasing in your burden to see the gospel, if you're not increasing in your rejoicing. Because again, according to Romans 5, 6 through 11, it says that the culmination of me realizing that God's love on display is Jesus Christ dying while I was still a sinner. It results in my rejoicing, in my wanting to see the good of others, see Jesus himself. That if that's not increasing, it's because I have forgotten what the wonder is of what it means to be forgiven of former sins. And guys, that gets marked by a couple of things. If you find yourself increasingly angry, if you find yourself increasingly anxious, frustrated at the world around you, we should, I'm not saying it's not frustratable, it doesn't cause anxiety. Of course it does. Of course it does. However, the wonder and the beauty of his glorious grace in saving us while we were still sinners. Guys, the only way to keep that wonder before us is to keep the word of God before us. Yes, privately, but this is also why we gather corporately to remind ourselves of what we forget every single week. We must remember that God, his love on display is the gospel and the gospel produces a rejoicing. And if that's not increasing, it's because we have lost sight of the wonder of being forgiven in the first place. And honestly, a lot of it is we forget what it meant to really be a sinner. A lot of us grew up in a situation that's just pretty normal, Christian home, Christian-esque home. Sometimes we, whether we have never been or perhaps just forget that at some point we were convinced that we really were just that spiritually bad. And that doesn't mean like a self-loathing kind of thing. That means looking at yourself in the mirror of Scripture, what it said about you before Christ. You know, really nominal statements like you were of your father Satan— I mean, really light stuff, like you hated God. The Bible says some pretty stark, terrible things about those who are without Christ and hope in the world. And to know that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, the anti-godly. So in light of this, we end up at salvation. We realize that there is none other that can save us, that we need nothing else but him. And the fact that it it culminates in the rejoicing in God means that there's nothing else that satisfies us in reflecting the love of him, but to rejoice in him. Nothing else satisfies. So basically, when you really get a view of the gospel and what's happening to you in salvation, it's just not enough to just go out and like have a party. I mean, that's great, but... That's not enough. I mean, you want to glorify God. Basically, you realize that I've been given so much in the gospel. I've been given so much in life in God. But really, all that I want, I just want God. When he saves you, that's part of what he builds inside of you. 
is that nothing will satisfy you ultimately but himself. That's actually the joy of getting older. If you're getting older rightly. You can go, you can go off and do the get off my lawn and be that guy. And I've so got that guy in me already. I, you can get there if you want to. But at the same time, if that's all of who you become, it's really sad. Because there is a sweetness and a perspective that comes with age. Especially as the outer man wastes away and the inner man being renewed. That can happen. That is just a reminder of what he planted in you at conversion. That all you want is him. That means then when you put God's love on display, and that's the second part, which man's display of God's love. So if God's love displayed is the gospel and man's display of God's love is really the assurance of salvation and how we then put that out there. Because basically, if you're a Christian, you're the only one that can show God's love. And if you don't or don't ever show God's love, it really brings into question whether or not you've experienced God's love. Then what we have to understand is I think that Peter gives us this other bookend of this is part of what it means to be sure of salvation. And there's no greater place to go than 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it's just a few pages to the right of 2 Peter. 1 John 4, 17 to the end of that chapter, 21. Verse 21, by this is love, and same word agapeo, perfected, and that word perfected means accomplished in us. So by this, love is accomplished in us, or it's shown to be accomplished in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Okay, so that, that shows this idea of the assurance that we are His. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. I think if I was brave enough to get a tattoo in the Greek, that might be it. I'll explain more, not why the tattoo part, but I'll explain more why that phrase is so critical in this. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So as we experience the love of God, it has to be put on display. And being put on display for others, it gives confidence and assurance that we are indeed His. But it's simultaneously a testimony and a witness to the world of who God is. It's all that wrapped up into one. It's it's beautiful and it's simple. Have you experienced the love of God for yourself? Are you putting God's love on display? It really actually is that simple. That's how you take such a big word like love that Peter just culminates with and says, here's love. And then you look at the context and read through it in the English and go, okay, Peter starts out by saying they're justified in God. Hmm, I think I remember in Romans 5, God's love on display. They're justified and reconciled. And then he talks about make sure that you are his right after he just says love. And that's about assurance of salvation. That's pretty, it starts to get simple. It starts to get manageable. There's handles. And yet it becomes very difficult because it's so stinking convicting. Because love is the culminating expression of a life that is changed by the gospel of Christ. It's not the ability to argue. It's not the ability to do apologetics. It's not the ability to uh, be, you know, kind of have a humble brag. Um, It's certainly not health or wealth. It's love. It's sacrificial love. It's the ability to give away all of who you are and the message and the glory of God without any expectation and really any desire of anything in return because it wouldn't satisfy a need anyway because he's all you want. The fruit of God in us is God's love through us. The fruit of God in us is God's love through us. It is so foreign to this world. It is like what the theologians would refer to as righteousness. They call it an alien righteousness. It is other than us. 
This love is alien. It is outside of us. Because the world will see love related to either self-gratification or self-glorification. Meaning, they'll either do something called love or say and use words like love in order to be gratified in their flesh. They'll say something to get something. Or if, they, if it's really sacrificial and it doesn't seem like, like basically, you know, if you have a, a person who clearly uh, professedly has, has, is not a believer in Christ and yet they adopt like 10 people. And that's a good thing. But still, at the end of the day, it comes down to self-glorification. They want to feel good about themselves for having done a good thing. It still stops short of what God's love is because God's love is about the glory of God and his goodness on display in the world. And really that's the best that man can do is something good for others for the purpose of making them feel good about themselves. And we are to be other. We are to be alien to this. We are to give up everything for the sake of being able to put him on display. Which means, guys... You can't just work to this end. Remember, these seven words are in an order. It's not a check, checklist, but they're in an order that makes sense. And invariably what this means is you have to increasingly be so deeply satisfied with God that by the end when you're giving up everything, it really feels like you're giving up nothing. Because he's all that you need and he's all that you want. When you are so deeply satisfied with God, whenever he lays something on your heart or when some, there is some call to this or call to that, it is just, and he's just simply made a provision, it is just almost a no-brainer. Oh, God's provided this, then let's do that. So that key phrase, as he is, so also are we in the world. I think this is a kind of a twofold statement. As he is, so also are we in the world. I think one way to look at that is the world's treatment of us. So as he is, so also are we. As he is, so how is he treated in the world? We need to expect that the world's going to treat Christians the way they treated Christ. This is how Jesus prayed in, in that great pastoral prayer in John 13 through 17. We, it needs to be expected. However, I think it also means as he is, what did he do while he was in the world? He was loving the world in a way that is God's kind of love. So we need to expect the same kind of treatment Christ had, but even in light of that treatment, which again, the people in the context of First Peter, of Second Peter, there's false teachers, there are people making false claims, misrepresenting, mischaracterizations, lies, and there is also external persecution. They're experiencing the kind of things that Christ experienced, but Christ kept loving, heading towards the cross. Peter is about to give up his life as the Spirit of God made clear. Peter is about to do the very thing that he is preaching. And we are called to do the same. We may not die in this way. We may live long lives and die old men and women. But there needs to be something in us that is so deeply satisfied in him that if he calls us to martyrdom on some foreign field or even here or whatever he may do, that we are willing to do it simply because we are so deeply satisfied with him that love has removed all fear. I'm not going to read Romans 8, uh, 31 through 39, but I would encourage you to do so because it will remind you, it's that famous passage of how nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But again, I encourage you to think about that in terms of that's because you are so deeply satisfied in God. You're so deeply wanting only Him. And the end of that, that section in John, he says, and this commandment we have from Him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. When you combine that with what we looked at at the end of the Romans passage, where it talks so much about that it's basically an act of worship, that when we experience God's love, the response is to worship Him. And we rejoice. Here, because we've experienced that and we rejoice, then we actually have, in a sense, a duty. I hate using that word, but we do have a responsibility to be obedient and actually live out love. So basically, the love of God is both worship and obedience, which 
shouldn't be a surprise because almost anything is both. I mean, sin is always an, an act of anti-worship. It's always an act of idolatry. But think about it in terms of love. So I want you to think about, are there some people around you? And I'm talking, and for today's context, I'm talking mostly about people in the world, people that are not Christians, okay? Because last week was more about the church world. But are there people, whether individuals you know or maybe subgroups, or groups of people that are just so unlovable, basically you, if you were honest, you'd just hate them. That has no place in the Christian life. Which means then you have both a worship problem and an obedience problem. Because if there are people that you hate, that means you're not worshiping God. That means you're not seeing the love that God has had for you while you were still a sinner correctly. In fact, it should go beyond just cleaning the slate. You need to think about what can I do to show that I love people? You know, if, if there is a group that you so loathe, it's probably because they are loving and putting something up that is so diametrically opposed to your morals. It's basically because there's idolatry. But what do they need? In that while they were still sinners, Christ came and died for the ungodly. God's love on display. Do you really think you're going to be able to yell at them about God's love on display, the kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. Think about the unlovables. Pray that God would soften your heart, maybe even break your heart. But do so by asking him to remind you of just how beautiful it was that he loved you while you were still a sinner. And just see if that combined effect doesn't start to produce some change in you. Okay, guys, I promise if you seek it this way, you will not become some liberal, some progressive. I promise you that you will simply become a tender-hearted, broken-hearted, deeply devoted, Bible-knowing, God-honoring and worshiping child, son or daughter of God. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we do thank you for your patience with us. We ask you to forgive us for not loving others like you have loved us. In fact, God, we, we ask you to forgive us for not working at it. I mean, this scripture says to make every effort. And we are very lazy when it comes to love. We, wanna, we want others to make it easy for us to love them. And when that comes to a lost world, that is ridiculous that we would act that way. And I'm so sorry that I have, that we have. God, many of us have grown so lazy with our speech in our homes that we've grumbled about, you know, different groups or types or lifestyles in front of televisions or whatever that our children have heard us and, and they have seen anything but an effort to love, an effort to show an empathy or a sadness that, that so much of the world is trying so hard to find acceptance and love and yet they're doing it in such a defiance of you kind of way. And yet what they need is that message of Romans 5, 6 through 11. So God, help us to live in such a way that if we were ever given an opportunity, even in front of the most unlovables from our own perspectives, to be able to share that text that while we were still sinners, while we were still so ungodly, that Christ died, that that is God's love on display, then help us to live in such a way that we can still have a hearing. So help us to love in that way initially so that God, I pray that that ultimate act of love, even though it may cost us, it may cost us friendships, it may cost us all kinds of things. Because God, ultimately we know that if, if we can show that kind, of, that kind of love expression that ultimately the speaking of the gospel is such a defining act of love 
to the world. And Lord, some will receive, but most will reject. And it will hurt. But as you are in the world, so are we. Let that ring true in us, God, even this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.